Listen fast. We'll read through verse number 19. It said in verse number 1 that it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary there for thy name's sake, or for thy name's sake. If when evil cometh upon us as a sword, judgment or pestilence or famine we stand before this house and in thy presence for thy name is in this house and cry unto thee in our affliction then thou will hear and help and now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt but they turned from them and destroyed them not behold I say how they reward us to come to cast out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, will thou not judge them? For we'll have no might against this great company that cometh against us, and neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benai, the son of Zael, and the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asa, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they will come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Let's pray together. Our Father, today we are, Lord, thankful for this day that you've given us. Lord, we're thankful to be in your house today, Lord, to praise you, to worship you, and Lord, to hear your precious word. Lord, I pray as we move through this service that all things that said and done would bring honor and glory to you. Lord, I'm thankful for the songs. I'm thankful for the prayers. I'm thankful, Lord, for the offerings. I'm thankful for all that you've done. But as we move into this message today, Lord, I pray that you would take the focus off me. And I pray today that you put it on your word and on your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray today for Christians that have gathered here today that we would be encouraged, that we would be challenged, Lord, by your word. And I pray if there's someone here that does not know Christ as his or her Savior, I pray before this day's over, Lord, that they would, by your Holy Spirit, be convicted that they need to accept your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might be saved. Father, again, we thank you and we praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, by the way of introduction, let me grab a quick drink here. Today, I titled my message that we need to put the O back in our prayers. And I took it, if we could, uh, this morning, look at verse number six. When Jehoshaphat prayed, he said, O Lord God. Now, and then later on in verse number 12, he said, O our God. Now, all of us today, we probably hear the words, 
oh God. And, and I'm just saying this in context, don't be offended by it today, but we hear it more like this, oh my God. That's the wrong way to use it. Even kids today, uh, I get on my kids and some things a little harder than others, and I don't want to hear them saying those words, oh my God, in the way that we shouldn't be using it. And even if you put it in a text message and it says OMG, it still means the same thing. Now, I'll get off my soapbox before I get in trouble, but Jehoshaphat here tells us how we are to use the word O, and we need to put it in our prayers. He cries out to God and says, O oh God, meaning you are the only God. You are the only one that can help us in our time of need. Here they are in a time of crisis, and he cries out, not, oh my God, what am I going to do? But he cries out, oh God, help us. I believe today, instead of us saying, oh my God, I'm going to run in fear, oh my God, what am I going to do? We need to get the O back in our prayers and say, oh God, help me. Oh God, show me what I need to do. And I believe Jehoshaphat does that today. The word of God also reminds me in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says that we confess our faults one to another. And it says that we're to pray ye one for another. But it says that we may be healed. But it says this, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or a woman availeth much. Amen. And I believe Jehoshaphat was a righteous man. Now, if you study him in the word of God, there's some more information to him in First and Second Kings and then here in Chronicles are not a lot. But Jehoshaphat started out uh, as a godly man. He made some poor decisions and he ended uh, his reign, I believe, to try to redeem himself and try to justify himself. We could compare that to a lot in our lives. But here we find him. He's the king of Judah and he's put in great responsibility. But what's happened is that all the countries and the nations that are around him have came against him and decided that they're going to attack him. They're going to attack Judah and they're going to attack Jerusalem. They're going to attack his people. And he has a problem on his hands. Now he could cry out in fear, oh my God. But instead he cries out to his Lord, oh Lord, help me. Oh Lord, show me. I want to show you some things about this text today I think can help us, that can encourage us to get our own back into our prayers. First thing I want to look at is found in verse number one. I've already explained it to you. We see a situation. Here they name all these big fancy names of these people. And no, I haven't studied Greek and Hebrew and Latin, all those things. I'll give you a secret. Somebody says, Pastor, how do you pronounce some of these words? Well, a lot of them I don't know how to pronounce. A lot of them I butcher them. But I'm supposed to have confidence. And if I'm going to butcher it, I'm going to butcher it with confidence. Amen? <laughs> and you don't know much different either. So that's why it sounds so good. But I'll give you my two cents on it. I'll give you my secret. I go to audio Bible, I go to the King James audio Bible, and I listen to James Earl Jones in that big, deep voice pronounce these words. And that's how I do it. So there's your secret. But here we see all these countries and all these nations that are going to gather against Jehoshaphat and are going to gather against his people. He's about ready to face a battle. Let me tell you this today. All of us are in that similar situation. We might not have countries or counties or places gathered around us that want to fight, but all of us today are in a battle. We talked about it in Sunday school. We are in a spiritual battle. I tell you today, uh, Christians are under attack. Families are under attack. Churches are under attack. Pastors are under attack. Pastors' wives are under attack. Their families are under attack. We need to stand firm, but all of us have a situation. You've probably heard this, and you've heard some young folks say this and use this slang. You see, I, I, can, I can be cool without saying OMG and those kind of things. Have you ever heard somebody say, the situation's about ready to get real? Anybody heard that? The situation is about ready to get real. And that's what's happening here for Jehoshaphat. It's about ready to get real. And uh, he knows what he needs to do. I can tell us today in our lives that the situation is almost ready to get real. You may say, well, Pastor, I can relate because I'm in that struggle. I'm in that battle. I'm right knee deep into that battle right now. And if you are, take heed from what Jehoshaphat did and put the O back in your prayers. Acknowledge that there's only one that can help you. Your pastor can pray for you, I can support you, and I can stand with you through your battle, but I cannot win the battle for you. That's where some people get mistaken. You see, that's that's my job, is to stand with you, to walk with you through those storms of life, to walk with you through those challenges of life. I know some in the congregation today are hurting. I know things are going on, but I can promise you this, that the Lord will be there to help you. The situation is real for us. Today, the great multitude came against Jehoshaphat, but there's a great multitude of things that are coming against us. The devil is using any tool he has available to attack Christians. You say, well, why does sometimes there's all these 
uh, bad people. All these uh, people that are living in sin, why do they seem like things are going so good for them? Let me give you one thing that I'll have for you. They are of no threat to the devil. No threat whatsoever. But we are. Those that are in this building today that profess to be Christians that take a stand against that, we are a threat to him. That's why he's going to fire his fiery darts at us. That's why the Lord give us, as we talked about in Sunday school, the armor of God that we can resist the darts of the fiery one of the devil. But there's a great multitude that comes against us. And then we also see in verse number two that there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee. Now, do you not think that he knew what was going on? He was a king. He had uh, military power available to him. I'm sure he had people looking around just like our military has intelligence today. He knew what was going to go on, but everywhere he went, somebody was reminding him, hey, wait a minute, king, what are you going to do? All these armies are gathered up to get to come against us. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And it's like sometimes people come to the to the pastor and say, well, here, we got a problem in the church. What are you going to do about it? And if you do that, be prepared for me to answer you and say, I don't know, what are we going to do about it? It's a team effort. It's a group effort. We're going to work through it together. What are we going to do about it? And that's kind of how Jehoshaphat answered his people. What are we going to do about it? We're going to go to the Lord. But don't you know that there's many people in our life and many times they don't do it intentionally, but when things are worse or at their worst for us or we're in our battle, that they come by and remind us constantly. Don't you feel like saying, are you stupid? Don't you don't think I know about it? I'm the one going through this and you've got to come through and remind me. Keep in mind sometimes that the devil can use things un that these people do it unintentionally. They don't know what they're doing. They're trying to be maybe helpful in some way, but they remind us of the constant struggle we're in. We need to remind them, wait a minute, we're in it together and we need to pray to God and get through it together. So first thing I'll move on, we see that there's a situation and I can tell you there's a situation in all of our lives today and all of it is different. And then in verse number three, we see the word fear. Look at verse number three, it says, Jehoshaphat feared. Let me stop there. Now, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy that we are not to have a spirit of fear. But if today, if we were to examine ourselves and ask ourselves this question, all of us could be honest at one point in time and say, we have had fear in our life somewhere along the line. I believe on the authority of God's word, not just my opinion, but we all will have fear. And it's how we deal with that fear as to whether or not we have a spirit of fear or whether we have a spirit of power. Jehoshaphat could have did what I said earlier. He could have went over to the corner. He could have give up. He could have said, you know what? I don't want my people to be slaughtered. I don't want any blood to be spilled. There's so many nations and so many armies that's coming against us, and I'm just going to throw in the towel. But that's not what he did. Even though he had fear in his heart, that's not what he did. Let me tell you today, somebody said, well, is it sin to have fear? Well, I can tell you all of us, the Bible says we've sinned and come short of God's glory. But if fear was a sin, we'd all be guilty of that sin because somewhere along the line, we've been afraid. Now, uh, I've always laughed and joked, and uh, and you, you you see today, and most people won't know what I'm talking about here. I don't know. Uh, I've been blessed not to have to deal with some of these things, but I'm going to use a, a spiritual country analogy for me. How many of you have had a little building, a little thing out back that when you were younger, you had to go outside and use the bathroom? How many of you, uh, I've heard old folks say it before, how many of you tried to get it done before you, it got dark before you went to bed because you were afraid to walk out there? Well, there's somebody in my family that found it funny that when somebody would go out to the outhouse, they would let them get halfway and they'd turn the light out on them so they couldn't see where they were going. And that's fear. You see fear on what's going to happen. You see, I told you it was a good spiritual analogy. All of us uh, have had fear. But what happens is this. It's how we act upon it. Do we come back in the house and look for the person that turned the light out on us and, and try to take revenge? Or do we go on and do what we need to do? But it goes on here. Look what Jehoshaphat did. It said in verse 3 that he feared... But look what he did. He says, and set himself to seek the Lord. You see, that, that phrase there, set himself, meaning that almost he had to make himself. Meaning that he didn't let the fear that was inside of him control his decisions. He set himself to seek the Lord. What I would encourage us today, no matter what we're going through, no matter what our situation is, that we need to set ourselves that we're going to seek the Lord. That we're going to make a stand. No matter what goes on in my life, we are going to seek the Lord. No matter how afraid I am, no matter how I don't want to go through this journey, no matter how I don't want to be involved in this, I'm going to set myself to seek the Lord. And this is what else he did. 
He proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. Now the Lord has been speaking to my heart about um, a fast. And you've never heard me preach much about a fast. You can look at me and say, he's, a, he's not one that fast a whole lot. And uh, I want to thank Julie for singing, the choir singing that song this morning. Uh, I found something out here at the church as a pastor. If you drop hints, people pick up on them very well. I made a comment, I think, last week or the week before about how I love that song and how it got me excited. And we're singing. I've made comments before about how I like certain foods. And automatically they show up. That's why I look like a dude. But anyway, uh, the Lord's been speaking in my heart about a fast. And we automatically think about fasting as giving up food or giving up drink, and that's part of it. But what a fast is this, is if we abstain from something that feeds our flesh so that we could have the Spirit feed us more. That's what a, that's what a fast is. And here, Jehoshaphat, this king... He set himself to seek the Lord and he proclaimed throughout all of Judah a fast. He was telling his people, you need to put aside anything that's going to take your focus away from God because the only way that we're going to win this battle is if God is going to fight it for us. That's what he was saying. I would encourage us today, I'm not going to call for a fast throughout our church, but I would encourage us throughout this time that we are going to begin celebrating the birth of our Savior. Maybe the Lord speaking to your heart that we can have a fast. Maybe it's just a, a couple hours. Maybe it's a half a day. Maybe it's a 24-hour fast. Whatever it may be for you, if the Lord has spoke to your heart, I would encourage you. I know it would do you some good if we give up something that feeds the flesh so that the Spirit could feed us more. You know, for me, I can, I can promise you what it would be right off the bat. And I can, uh, my kids are here, they're listening to this, but I'm just as guilty. It'd be that little device that we call a smartphone that we hold in our hand that we put in our pockets. That's what I'm going to try to fast from. That's what I want to try to do less of and, and focus more. I can tell you as your pastor, if I would spend uh, more time in the Word of God and less time on my phone, I would be a better pastor. If I would spend more time with my family, I'd be a better father. I'd be a better husband. I'm just using that for my example. But anything that feeds our flesh, we can abstain from it for a period of time that the Lord might feed us spiritually. And I would encourage you to do so. And that's what... Jehoshaphat does. He makes a decision. He makes a decision that he's not going to fear and he makes a decision that he is going to have a fast and that he is going to seek the Lord in every single thing that he does. And then it says there uh, in verse number five, look at what it says. Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. What is he doing? He's standing giving reverence to God. He is the king, he's the ruler of his people, yet he's standing and he's giving reverence to God because he's about ready to do what I told you what the title of the message was. He's about ready to make it real. He's about ready to put the O back in his prayer. We see here, if we could, the prayer is in verse number 6 through 13. Let me go through a little bit now that you know what I'm talking about with my title. Maybe we'll understand it a little bit better. He, he is standing before the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord. Much like what I'm doing today, we're standing before the congregation in the house of the Lord. And in verse number six, he starts his prayer. And he says, O Lord God of our fathers. You know, he could have started out and he could have said, Lord God, help us. Lord God, we need you. But he didn't do that. He was getting the attention of his people. He wasn't getting the attention of God. God already had his attention. He knew what, what the situation was before, but he's saying, O Lord God of our fathers. Are not thou God in heaven and rulest over thou all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might so that there is none able to withstand me? Here's where sometimes the liberals will come in and they'll say, well, here's this king and he's just even asking questions. He's not asking questions to God. He's reminding his people through his prayer of how good God has been to him. He's reminding his people of how God has taken care of the kingdoms. He goes on in the form of a question again. He says in verse number seven, Are not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? You see, how is he getting to relate to these people by using Abraham, by using something that they can relate to, someone that they thought so much of? And he says in verse eight, And they dwell therein, have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying... And then he says, if, when. 
Now notice how Jehoshaphat says that. Many times I've told you before, for us it's not if, it is when. And that's what he's saying to his people. He starts out if, when evil cometh upon us. He's telling them that it's coming. I don't exactly know when, but I know that they're forming these armies. I know that they're going to try to come in and, and uh, destroy us. But look at some of the things that he uses. He says, when evil cometh upon us, first he says, as the sword. Now we know that that's what the battle is that they're going to face is. It's going to be a physical battle. They want to come in. They want to destroy them. They want to wipe them out. But later he goes on and he says, upon us as the sword. And then he says, as judgment. And then he says, or pestilence. And then he says, or famine. Meaning he's also telling his people, this is the battle that's before us right now, but I can promise you there's going to be other battles that we need to face as well. There's going to be battles of judgment. There's going to be battles of pestilence. Anybody know what that big fancy word pestilence means? It means disease. It means uh, sickness. Some of us here today are, are going through some of those type of things. All of us. How many of you would ever think that you could raise your hand and say that we lived through a global pandemic? I'm still questioning whether or not we did or not. I don't want to cast doubt into your mind or not. But I'm not saying that COVID wasn't real. But I believe it was overplayed. But anyway, we have came through it. You say, why do you know that we've come through it? Well, let me, let me word this in a, in a good way where I don't want to get myself in trouble. But I went up to the hospital Friday night to make a visit to the ER and I walked in with my mask on and I went back to visit the family and they said, you know, you don't have to wear that mask anymore. And I said, are you kidding me? I said, they said, no, the Valley Health lifted, lifted their restrictions. If you have, don't have flu symptoms or COVID symptoms or whatever, you don't have to wear the mask. I'm about ready to break and dance loose in the emergency room. Praise the Lord. They finally got some sense about it. Amen. They finally got some sense about it. I took it off because you know why? I put it on out in the weight room. I haven't coughed for two weeks, but the very first time I put that mask on, I started coughing. Everybody was looking over, looking around at me. But that's what's happened here. Pestilence. We've been through it. And we we may go through other times and things. But guess what? The Lord will take care of us. And that's exactly what he's telling here. Jehoshaphat's telling his people, the sword's going to come against us. Judgment's going to come against us. Pestilence is going to come against us. And he says, famine. Now, he was probably speaking about physical famine, being short of food. Thankfully, all of us today, I'm sure we, we gathered somewhere along the line with family or friends, and we just made a pig out of ourselves at Thanksgiving. I'm glad, I'm thankful that the leftovers are gone. The last piece of pumpkin pie has been sliced and gone away with because I can't, I don't have any willpower. I don't, I'm not able to, I'm sitting there and thinking, well, I'm going to get a piece of pie. But you see, my uh, reasoning is this, I won't put Cool Whip on top of it. And it'll be okay because, you know, basically Cool Whip don't have a lot of fat in it anyway. That's, that's, beside the, that's beside the point. But I'll move on. They're going to face famine. He says, we stand before this house and in thy presence. Meaning this, remember what I said, he stood before his congregation. He's telling them these things. He says, we stand before this house in thy presence. He says, for thy name is in this house. You know, I could have used that for a title of a good sermon. It's his name in your house. It's his name in this house. I know his name's in this house. I know that he's present here because we come to worship him. But I would ask you, is his name in your house? Do you stand and give him reverence? I'll skip over a little bit. This is extra. This is not part of my sermon. But verse 13 also spoke to my heart that I could use that for a sermon. I may do that later on down the road. I shouldn't give you all my clues and hints. But verse 13 said, All Judah also stood before the Lord. Now this is a little bit later on. But what it says, look what they stood with. With their little ones, their wives, and their children. I would encourage us today, especially men that are gathered here today, we need to be the spiritual leaders of our homes. We need to stand for our homes. We need to put the O back in our prayers and know that his name is in our house. And when we stand, we need to stand with our little ones. We need to stand with our wives and we need to stand with our children. That's how important it is. I got a little bit sidetracked, but the Lord does that from time to time. But here we see his prayer and he's standing before his congregation. He goes on and he uses... Some of these other terms, he says in verse number 10, And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. He's telling us who they are a little bit. Whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade. He says, When they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them, destroyed them not. He says this in verse number 11. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come up to cast us out of thy possession. He's saying, 
what is their reward? What are they going to do that you've done for them? They're going to come in. They're going to try to take everything that we have. And then in verse number 12, he uses it again. He says, O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great cause. You see, when we put O oh back in our prayers, we're acknowledging exactly what Jehoshaphat says in verse number 12. He said, we have no might against this great company. And I can tell you this, the devil is a defeated foe. And as long as we have the Lord on our side, he will always be defeated. But if we're trying to face our battles and fight our battles without him, we are the ones who are going to be defeated. Amen. Jehoshaphat says here, he says, we have no might against this great company. He says, that cometh against us. And then he said this, neither know we what to do. Have you ever been in a situation where you just didn't know what to do? Here's a, a king standing before his people, standing before his congregation, and he's acknowledging to them, I just don't know what to do. I would encourage you this, that we need to have grace for one another. When we're in that situation that we don't know what to do, we need to have grace. There may come a time when your pastor may be faced with a situation and a challenge, and I may come back to the words of Jehoshaphat and say, I just don't know what to do. As long as I follow up with what he does, but I know who does. He says this, I don't know what to do, but look what he says in the last part of verse number 12. He says, our eyes are upon thee. Our eyes are upon thee. Second question in, inside the message today hidden would be this, is the name of the Lord in your house and is your eyes upon him? Too many times our eyes are on the enemy. Our eyes are on the battle. Our eyes are on what's right in front of us and our eyes are not on him. Here's this great leader of, this, of these people. He's telling them that we have no might against this great company. We don't know what to do, but he says our eyes are upon thee. Now, he's not addressing the crowd and telling them that. He's not saying, hey, forward for Christ, we've got a challenge ahead of us and I just don't know what to do. That would be kind of weak, wouldn't it? But I could stand before you and say, hey, we've got a challenge before us. I don't know what to do. You don't know what to do, but I know who does. God does and our eyes need to be on him. He gives that example. And then it says there that all of Judah, all the people that he was addressing, all those that were in the congregation, they stood before the Lord. And I told you they stood with their little ones, with their wives, and with their children. In that prayer, there would be what you would call an effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. And I know that the Lord will honor this here, that uh, it does avail as much. I'll come down to the close of my message today is this. Look at verse number 14. When we are uh, dependent upon the Lord, when we put the O back in our prayers, the Spirit of God will show up. How many of you, before you left the house today, prayed that the Spirit of God would show up into our church services? All of us, you lift our hands up. Even if you didn't, I'm giving you permission to lie in church. <laughs> all of us. All of us. Just kidding. All of us should ask the Spirit of the Lord to come into our service. All of us should ask the Spirit of the Lord to come into our homes, come into our lives, because that's what we need. But here, there was one person in the crowd. I don't know that there was not others that was listening, but I know the Word of God, there was one person in the crowd that was listening to the sincerity of Jehoshaphat's prayer. Listen to verse number 14. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benai, the son of Jael, and the son of Mattanai, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, listen, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. In the midst of the prayer, the Spirit of the Lord showed up. Isn't it, isn't it great? Isn't it wonderful when the Spirit of the Lord shows up? Isn't it wonderful when the Spirit of the Lord shows up and convicts somebody's heart? Hey, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know that I've ever put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they take that next step in their life. It's because it's not because of my words. It's not because of your words. It's because that the Spirit of God has come in and taken over. And that's what's happened through this one person. It, the Spirit of the Lord came in. Now we just finished our revival. And we did plan it strategically as your pastor. I tried to plan it strategically that it would go inside with thanksgiving, things that we can be thankful for, but that we can take revival and that we can continue it on in our lives. And I believe if we put God first in our life, that we will let the Spirit of God come into work and revival will continue on. But here, through one man, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to this man in the midst of the congregation. And look what he said in verse 15. He said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou King Jehoshaphat. He's even addressing the king that's there. He says, Thus saith the Lord unto you. He says, 
Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. In that encouraging words, the battle is not yours, but it's God's. You see, again, as I said earlier, as I started out in my very first point is all of us are going through a battle. All of us are going through a situation. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I do know this, that we keep our eyes upon the Lord, allow the Spirit of the Lord to come in, and we'll be able to say that, be not afraid or dismayed by reason of this great multitude. He's saying, I don't, we look around and we look at this great armies, we look at all these problems that's before us, and it's going to have us to be afraid. It's going to have us to be dismayed. But he says, the battle is not ours, but it's God's. You see, one person here, Jehoshaphat was uh, sincere with his prayers. He put the O back in his prayers, and the Spirit of the Lord came in, and it spoke to this man's heart. And then in verse number 16, we see now instruction that's given. You see, many times if we listen and be still, God will give us all the instructions that we need. Look at verse number 16. He says, Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they will come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Now, isn't it amazing that the Spirit of God has spoke to this man and he knows exactly every move that the enemy is going to make? I can promise you this. Our God knows every move that the enemy is going to make. He knows every tactic. He knows every tool. He knows everything that the enemy is going to try to come against us with. But he goes on in verse number 17. Listen to these words. Now, I'm sure all these people are motivated. They've, they've heard their king. They've seen the Spirit of the Lord came down upon this man. And I'm sure they're ready to go out and face battle. Many times if you if you listen to a, a good gospel song or you hear a good message preached, I don't know what church you would go to to hear it, but anyway, if you hear it, you might get motivated and think that you're ready to go out and fight. I believe one of our evangelists said during our meetings, uh, I think it was Brother Bruce that said he was ready to, to fight the devil with a water pistol. And I got a little kick out of that. I thought well, that's, that's good, pretty good analogy to use. But sometimes we are, and I believe this crowd was about ready to do that. They were about ready to go out and charge hell with a water pistol. But it says in verse number 17, he says, ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Listen to the instructions. It says, set yourself and stand ye still. You see, many times in our life, we have to be still. We have to be still. Turn with me, if you would, over to Psalm, chapter, Psalm number 46. Psalm 46. Verse number 10, one verse. It says, be still and know that I am God. And it says, I will be exalted among the heathen and I will be exalted in the earth. Isn't it amazing here for us to be still and know that he's God? The psalmist writes that God will be exalted among the heathen. It's kind of the same words that God is using to explain it to us. He says here in this verse, he says, you not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still. And he says, and see, back to our text in, uh, in Second Chronicles, verse number 17, and see ye the salvation of the Lord is with you. He's, he's telling them, he says, just stand still and watch me do what I do. Just stand still and watch me work. Just stand still and watch the power that I have. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. And then he says, O Judah, He's getting their attention just the same way that he put that O in his prayer. And Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. You see, many times that's how we need to fight our battles. Sometimes we just need to be still. And it's hard. I'm preaching to myself. We just need to be still and say, God, we need to say, oh God, show me what you can do. Oh God, show me what you want me to do. And then Jehoshaphat finishes it out with what he should do as a leader. He worships the Lord. Look at verse number 18. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. Now I want you to notice two positions that Jehoshaphat has been in through this time. First, he stood before his congregation and he prayed to God. Now he's still before the congregation. He's still before all of Judah and Jerusalem. It says he bowed his head with his face to the ground and look what happened. All Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord worshiping the Lord. 
They didn't question, you mean all we got to do is go out and just stand there? All we got to do is just, just show up and, and you're going to take care of this battle for us? They weren't asking questions. Why? Because the Spirit of God was on their heart. And Jehoshaphat fell down. He worshiped God before them. And they all did the same thing. And look at verse number 19. The Levites of the children of the Kohites and the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. They were worshiping the Lord. Why? Because they knew they hadn't even went to the battleground yet. They hadn't even went to the battlefield. But they were confident enough knowing that God had promised them that he was going to take care of that battle for them. I would encourage you to read the rest of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. You'll find it interesting that when they showed up, Jehoshaphat instructed his army to sing songs, to sing hymns. Wouldn't you think that's a little bit odd that I'm going to stand out here and the Lord told me just to stand, be still. But now the Spirit of the Lord has spoke to his heart and he's going to sing hymns. Wouldn't you think that would draw attention from the enemy? But the Lord, the Lord protects him, the Lord prevails, and the Lord keeps his promises. This morning I would encourage you, if you haven't got anything from this message today, is this, that we need to get sincere with our prayers. You know, many times I believe we get into that repetition of prayers. And sometimes I do as a pastor. I'll say the same thing every week and every week out. You're going to hear me somewhere along the line say that I don't want the focus to be on me because I don't. Because if I want the honor and glory to go to God, not for me. It doesn't mean that I'm just saying it repetitiously. It's because I mean it. It's sincere. We can say the same things, but we have to be sincere with our prayers. And we have to realize that all of us are going to face battles. All of us are going to face trials. And all of us today are going to be afraid. It's how we act upon that fear to whether it determines whether we have a spirit of fear or whether we have a spirit of power. I would encourage us all today to do what Jehoshaphat did, put the O back in our prayers, turn the heat up on it, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, today for this day again that you've given to us. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the scriptures found in the New Testament, those found in the Old Testament. There's, Lord, they're all alive and they're real and they can help us. Lord, they can encourage us and they can show us. Amen. Today, I, I'm thankful for this story that we read, that you prevailed, that even though these people were in the midst of a trial, in the midst of a battle, that you came in and you did what you do, Lord, and you defeated the enemy. I pray today if there's people here that's going through a trial, going through a battle, going through something, that today that they put the O back in their prayer. They turn the heat up on their prayers. And they look to God and know that He's the only one that can help them get through it.